I am sure of this. I am sure of this. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. To, to live, live is Christ, Christ, and to die is gain. At the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth heaven, and under the earth. In heaven and on earth, earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, Jesus is, Lord. Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who I can do all things. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. My God, my God, my God will supply every need of yours according, according to, his, to riches his riches and glory, and glory in, Christ in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Awesome. Good morning. How many of you guys wish you looked that great at the beach? I watch that and I'm like, man, they look so cool. And then you go and you think I'm going to look just that cool. And you see the, you see the pictures later and you're like, no. No, not cool. Good morning. So glad to be with you guys this morning. Um, Jake and Mark, they are actually in Israel this week, which is really cool. I don't think Mark's, I hear, I heard your voice, Lori. Oh, he's never been, right? Nope. So Jake, they've never been over there and they are having a really great time. They're with 30 other pastors and they're on a, a really cool tour of Israel. And Jake has sent me a lot of pictures of the food. And he's told me a lot about the food a lot about the food. And um, it sounds really awesome. I think they're having a wonderful time. He told me um, his very first full day there, he goes, this was the best day of my life besides our wedding day. <laughs> Which I kind of think he just added in there as a side, you know, like all of a sudden was like, wait, 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 what am I supposed to say? I told that to someone earlier and they said, and the day of your children's birth, right? And I was like, nah, he didn't even mention that. No. That wasn't, didn't make the cut. But they're having a really wonderful time and they're going to be back um, this Thursday and. uh Lori and I are excited that they're going to come home. Yes. Um, but I get to talk to you guys today. You know, I'm so excited about this series we're in. We're um, diving into the book of Philippians. Philippians is a book in the Bible that was written by Paul. Paul, um, we call him, some people call him the Apostle Paul. And he wrote this book to a church in Philippi. And so they named it Philippians mystery solved, right? But um, the, this book of Philippians, Paul, he actually wasn't a disciple of Jesus. You know, we have, when you read through the new, the gospels, the new Testament, you hear about the disciples of Jesus, the 12 men who Jesus called out and they followed him everywhere he went. Paul wasn't one of those men. Paul actually was a Pharisee. And if you've been in church for a while, when you read the Bible and you hear sermons, a lot of times the Pharisees are like the bad guys, right? You know, which they weren't really actually the bad guys. They were people who were very devout Jews, who knew all of the law, who were experts on what was going on. And sometimes they were mean, right? <laughs> so that's why they get a bad name. But Paul, he is a Pharisee. And actually, he did not accept the teachings of Jesus. It, a lot of people believe that he was probably there when Jesus was crucified. And after Jesus was crucified, he rose again, right? And that's... he. he when his disciples moved out and began telling everyone about Jesus, that was the beginning of the church, right? That was the beginning of the Christianity movement. Paul was very much against that. He was actually very zealous to stop Christians from spreading what he would have said was propaganda, right? And so he was getting permission. In, in Acts, there's even a verse where it talks about Paul dragging people out of their homes, to stop Christianity. He did not want it to happen. And he'd gotten permission from um, the king to go to another city and to stop Christianity. And on his way, it's on the road to Damascus, on his way to this place, suddenly Jesus appears to him. Now, Jesus had already gone up into heaven. So this is a miraculous moment where Paul sees a bright light. He's literally blinded and he hears Jesus speak to him. And so here's Paul saying, Jesus is not God. He was not the son of God. He was not who he claimed to be. He was not the Messiah. And here is Jesus right in front of him saying, Paul, why do you persecute me? Why are you coming after me? And Paul's like, who are you, Lord? And 
God responds, Jesus responds, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. And from that moment on, Paul changes the complete direction that he's going in his life. No longer does he want to stop Christianity. Now he becomes the, the biggest, you know, uh, microphone of Christianity. He goes around, he starts so many churches and he begins to write to those churches, write to those pastors, helping them on their way. And so he actually ended up writing two thirds of the New Testament, which is a really incredible thing. And so when we're diving into Philippians, this is the guy who wrote it, Paul. And I love that story because it's a lot like all of our story, huh? We, we're on our way, we have our agenda, we know what our life is about, but one moment with Jesus and it changes everything, right? One moment with God and we realize, man, everything that I thought my life was about, it's not about, and we can change our way. And that's such a beautiful thing. You know, when I was um, young, I was a like a, you know, teenager, an a, older teenager, sorry, can't think of words. Older teenager, um, I've only ever, intentionally dated one person and that was Jake, but I've accidentally dated two other people. <laughs> and one of them was really embarrassing and I'm not gonna tell you that one because it took like 28 days to realize that I was supposedly in a relationship with this person. But the other person, it was just, it was just a one date. And so my friend, she was like my best friend. She really had this a crush on this manager of Dutch Bros, right? It all starts at Dutch Bros. True love, that's where it happens, right? So she really likes this guy. He's a manager of Dutch Bros. And, and um, so every time I hung out with her, she'd always wanna go buy Dutch Bros. And so she, the other guy that was always with him was the assistant manager. And so we'd always go to the Dutch Bros. Well, you know, they're kind of starting to like hit it off. And now they're like texting. I think there was texting back then. And, you know, calling each other. And so one day she calls me and says, Bethany, do you want to go to um, this arcade at a family fun center and um, play games with so-and-so and so-and-so? And, -so -and, -so? and it's the manager and the assistant manager. And I'm like, sure, because it's my best friend, right? So I'm going to help her out, whatever. He's like, he's a nice guy. So let's, sure, let's do it. So we go and we are going to play arcade games. And it's, it's, the right amount of awkwardness, right? It's not, it's just awkward. You know, you don't really know these people. It's just awkward. And they like both kind of like each other, but you don't know if the other, you know what I mean? It's just it's awkward, right? How many of you guys been the third wheel? It's awkward. You're like, okay, you like each other. Come on, let's move on. All right. But anyways, um, it's just, you know, awkward. We're playing games and everything. And um, pretty soon they kind of like pair off. They're like, we're going to go play the Jurassic Park game. You know, the, if you guys ever play that one, it's the one where you get inside the game and then there's curtains. It's really romantic. You get to blow up dinosaurs, um, that kind of thing. And so they go to, together to go play the Jurassic Park game. And I'm like, oh, great. Now it's real awkward, right? Because now I'm just hanging out with this guy. I don't really know him. And he works at Dutch Bros, you know. And I'm like, hey, you know, cool. They're playing Jurassic Park. And he's like, you want to play air hockey? Well, little known fact about me. I'm extremely good at air hockey. There's no explanation for my talent for air hockey. I didn't grow up with an air hockey table. I'm just naturally good at air hockey. Some people, you know, are naturally good at useful things in life. Not me. I got air hockey. And that's great, right? For this moment only. But he's like, let's go play air hockey. So we, we go over. I'm like, yeah, let's play air hockey. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to, I'm going to trick him, right? I'm going to cream this guy. He has no idea. I'm so good at air hockey. And so, you know, he puts in like $100 to play one game because that's how arcades are. And, and we get ready to play. So we start and I'm like kind of pretending like, you know, oh, it's this. I use this thing. Ha, 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 ha. You know, I should have, I should have put money down, you know, didn't one of those pool things where you... I don't know what that's called. But anyway, so I'm like, yeah, let's play. And so, you know, it's going ding, 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 ding. And then I'm like, <laughs> right? And I just totally cream him. It's like 10 to zero, totally one. And then I'm talking garbage in his face. You know, I'm just like, in your face. You had no idea I was so good at your hockey. You know, and I'm just like, you know, talking smack. He gets so weird. So weird. He reacted the weirdest way possible. I'm like, don't you like it when people talk smack in your face when you win? Right? Um, and he's just acting super weird. And he kind of like throws down the thing, you know? And he's like, whatever. And I'm like, sore loser. I'll play you again. I'll win again. <laughs> Choose another game. I'll lose. This is the only game I'm good at, right? But, well, ski ball. I'm pretty good at ski ball, too. But anyways... <laughs> I'm like, you, I'm like trying to figure out why he's acting so weird. And so he just kind of like goes over and like awkwardly stands by the exit. And I'm like, this is awkward. And I look over at my friends. They're still like hanging out in Jurassic Park, you know, and I'm like, geez, what do I do now? You know, 
I don't have a million dollars to play arcade games. So I'm just hanging out. And um, the guy, he actually went up to his friend and was like, come on, let's get out of here. I'm done. And they left. And I was like, that was the weirdest thing ever. Why did they react that way? And slowly I realized I was not just hanging out as a third wheel to my friend. I was on a double date. And I creamed that guy and humiliated him. And, you know, I felt really bad. I didn't try to make up for it, though, because I didn't like the guy and I was not interested. So I was like, oh, that was awkward. I feel horrible that I humiliated him so bad, but I'm not going to fix it because I'm not interested. But, you know, in, in Philippians chapter 2, that's what we're going to look in today. Paul is writing to the church of Philippi about humility. And so we're going to talk today about what is humility. And we're going to dive into that subject today. So we've all been in a humiliating situation, right? But what is humility? In chapter 2, verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 3, it says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. Now, this is a really powerful passage, right? These are a powerful few verses. But today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the historical piece of these verses that we don't exactly understand. You see, for us, this is just awesome. To me, it's awesome. Do you guys think it's awesome? When I hear about the power of Jesus, of who he was, about how he lived his life, that's impacting. That's powerful. But to the early Christians, this had a completely different kind of significance than we understand. You see, today, if someone said, write out the 10 best virtues any human can have, right? You know, we'd write down different things and almost for sure, humility would be on the list. Because humility to us is a virtue, right? We, 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 we elevate humility. We say, if you're a humble person, that's a good thing. None of us like it when you meet a braggy person, right? You meet someone who comes in unannounced and they start talking about how good they are at air hockey. You're like, come on, get out of here. Who are you, right? I'm kidding, air hockey, no one cares about that, right? But, but we don't like it when someone comes in and just starts talking only about themselves, about everything they've achieved, everything they've done, how much money they have. Some of you bachelors are like, oh, that's what I'm doing wrong. (laughs) Oh, they don't like that. Okay, all right, all right, mental note, right? We we don't like that. It's not a virtue. We like it when people are humble. Some some people, because of social media, you always see the humble brag, right? It's where you're bragging, but you're acting like you're not bragging, you know? Like some people are like, I got all my kids down for a nap at the same time. I've never written that because it's never happened to me. But, you know, but we don't, we don't like it when people brag about themselves. It's something that's abhorrent to us as a society. Well, it wasn't like this all through all of history. That's actually something that's only happened since Jesus' time. Humility actually was never a virtue. And humility, if you talked about someone being humble, it wouldn't be a thing that anyone wanted to be. It would mean that there was something wrong with you, that you must have something that is shameful about you or some place that you've messed up? Why would you purposely lower yourself? The society where Jesus came from was all about shame and honor. And if you had done something good, then you should tell people about it, right? Because you're awesome. That's the way that they thought. And as long as you weren't lying, it was perfectly acceptable to tell everyone about all the great things that you did and about the great person that you were. On the other hand, if you weren't a great person, it was a really deep dive, right? There was a shame and honor. And so everything they did, it was about not causing shame to try everything you did to not cause shame on yourself and on your family and to brag about all the good things that you are. If you go back in history, you can see a lot of the different emperors and they would write these these crazy histories about themselves right? About all the things they did and all the good they did for their people and all the wars they fought and all the money. And and now we would look at that and be like, who talks like this? 
Well, they did because to them, that was a virtue to just tell people, honestly, I'm amazing, right? And so Jesus, when he was walking around on earth and telling people that they needed to be humble, when he was literally going to the poor and staying with them and sitting with them, when he would eat with the tax collectors, it's also significant because these were people that everyone knew were bad. And in society, you only wanted to elevate yourself. You never purposely humbled yourself. And yet that's what Jesus time and time again was telling people to do, right? In one, of, one famous verse, he says, but the son of man, meaning the son of God, him, did not come to be served, but to serve, right? He tells them, I didn't come for people to come and serve me, even though I'm king, but I came to serve you. And that's a huge deal. For us today, we hear that and we're like, that's a great thing. I should try to be like that. But to them, that was mind boggling, Right? Why would you not come if you're a king and let people serve you? They didn't understand what Jesus was trying to say. And the truth is, it wasn't until Jesus was crucified that people really had to make a decision on whether he was right or whether he was wrong about what he was saying. You see, the crucifixion, to be crucified back then, was it was a, um, a punishment that was reserved for only the very worst of criminals. Is the very worst people, this is what we will do to them. Why? Because it was the most humiliating thing they could do to someone. They would literally whip them. They would hurt them. Then they would either tie them or they would nail them onto two boards, the cross, right? And then they would leave them there. And the person did not die quickly. The person who was on that cross would die very slowly. In fact, in order to die, you, in order to stay alive, you would have to pull yourself up by your arms that are either nailed or tied to the cross in order to get in a breath. And then you would let yourself back down. And you'd have to keep doing that until eventually the person actually died of not being able, having no strength to pull themselves up anymore. And so it's a really big deal that Jesus died on a cross. To us, we say, no, crosses, that's like the symbol of Christianity, right? And we have crosses, we have necklaces, we have bumper stickers, we have different things, you know, that on our Bible, there's a cross. We don't understand that this was actually the most humiliating form of death that someone could have. And so then when someone would die that way, everyone, the Christians had to decide, wow, how did this person that we think was the son of God, how could the son of God die in the worst death that there was? John Dixon has a quote about this. He says, ancient Mediterranean cultures pursued honor and avoided shame at all costs. Honor was proof of merit, shame the proof of worthlessness. But what does this say about the crucified Jesus? That was the question that confronted the early Christians. Logically, they had two options. Either Jesus was not as great as they had first thought, his crucifixion being evidence of his insignificance, or the notion of greatness itself had to be redefined to fit with the fact, I gotta read it from here, of his seemingly shameful end. A thing was covering it. Opponents of early Christianity happily accepted the first option. The crucifixion was incontrovertible evidence that Jesus was a pretender to greatness. Hence, St. Paul's famous statement that the cross was foolishness to the Greeks. Christians took the other option. For them, the crucifixion was not evidence of Jesus' humiliation, but proof that greatness can express itself in humility, the noble choice to lower yourself for the sake of others. And so the Christian church, they literally were coming against what cultures thought was right, what culture thought was good. They weren't just, you know, having a new religion that was so exciting. It was that they literally were going completely counterculture to what everyone else said greatness was. John Dixon goes on, he has another great quote, but just as astonishing as the early description of Jesus as God is, is the fact that these first Christians could in the same breath say or sing God and cross. The idea that any great individual, let alone one in the very nature of God, could be associated with a shameful Roman crucifixion is just bizarre. Contemporary Christians may find this thought easy enough, but that's only because of 2,000 years reflection on this narrative. Western history is now utterly cruciform, shaped by the event of Jesus' crucifixion. Well, the way that we look at it is completely different than the way that they would have looked at it. And so what Paul is writing to this church is so significant 
because he's reminding them. Remember, what we believe is not what everyone else believes. We believe in Jesus who humbled himself and we all must follow in his example. So we all know that we should be more humble. Paul here is saying you should be more humble, right? But how do you be more humble? It's not that easy, correct? How many of you guys think about yourself when you wake up in the morning? That's really, honestly, that's the first thing that we think about. Why? Because that's, that's who we are. We're naturally not humble people. So today I have four ways for us to be more humble. The first one, how to be humble, we have to admit that we're proud. We have to first admit that we're proud right? That's hard. It's hard to admit that we're proud, but every single one of us, the core of who we are is, is proud. You know, maybe in this room, you're a person who deals with a lot of insecurity. I, I hate this, but it's true. Insecurity is just a form of pride. Why? Because you're still only thinking about yourself. If I'm only worried about who I am and I'm not good enough, it's still only about me. So the very first step for any of us to be able to be a humble person is that we first have to admit that we're proud. C.S. Lewis has a really great quote about this. Someone messaged me last week and said, Jake hasn't given us a C.S. Lewis quote in a few weeks. (laughs) I was like, he's off his game. (laughs) So here you go, I'll I'll give you one. C.S. Lewis said, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you had to say to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you are a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud and a biggish step too. At least nothing, whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. At least we're all in the same boat though, right? Right? That's That's not easy to hear, but at least we're all in the same boat. So we have to admit that we are proud. Second, humility is a verb until it becomes second nature. Humility really has to be an action word, right? Until it becomes who we are. I love in verse six through eight, talking about Jesus, it says, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. He made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. That means he actively had to make himself. It was an action word. He made himself nothing taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus was actively humble. He made himself humble. And in the same way, every single one of us, we have to actively be humble until it becomes really who we are, right? And number three, We need to start looking at the interests of others. Verse three and four, it says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit. How many times do we make decisions based on rivalry or conceit? Rivalry meaning that you wanna be better than someone else. You wanna prove them wrong, right? You're in competition with someone else. How many times do we make decisions based on that? And they they hardly ever work out, right? (laughs) And yet we do, we compare ourselves to other people and we live our lives based on those comparisons. Living our lives out of rivalry or conceit. If we're not comparing ourselves to others, we're jealous of others. We live our lives based on jealousy of what someone else has that I don't have. And what Paul's saying here is don't don't do anything from rivalry or conceit, but in humility, count others as more significant than yourself. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. I love this verse because we have to look to our own interests, right? You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of your family. You have to take care of what you, you've been given on this earth. You have to look into your own interests. But he's saying, also look into the interests of others. Also on your way, help others and count other people more significant than you. There's this great, great quote, 
Gregory Boyle, he's quoting it in his book, but he says, sometime back at the turn of the century, during a general election, some pundit tried to compare and contrast Bill Clinton, Al Gore, and George W. Bush. He said, Bill Clinton walks into a room and wants everybody in the room to like him. Al Gore walks into the room and wants everyone to think he's right. W walks into the room and wants the room to know he's in charge. We all feel all of these at one time or another because they're fear-based responses. And it's hard to get out from under that dread. Our frightened selves want only for the gathered to like us, to agree with us, or to be intimidated by us. What do you do when you walk into a room? Do you want everyone there to like you, to accept you, to notice you, to recognize how great you are, to realize that you're in charge? I've never had that feeling, <laughs> especially at my own house, right? <laughs> None of you little kids think I'm in charge. <laughs> proven by your behavior, right? What is it that you really think when you walk into a room? Even if you say, no, I walk into a room and I don't want anyone to notice me. I want to hide in the shadow. Do you know you're still only thinking about yourself? What was it like when Jesus walked into a room? What do you think he thought? He is the one who is right. He is the one who is in charge. He is the one that we should all agree with. But I think that when Jesus walked into a room, he just felt love for each person in the room and probably went and stood with the outcast and began to share his love with them. And that's who God asks us to be, people who are humble, who don't walk into rooms hoping everyone will recognize them, but walk into rooms realizing everyone here is significant because God created them, because God made them. And do they know that God yet? Because if they don't, I want to share it with them, right? That's who God wants us to be. Number four, humility becomes easy once you realize that your life is not your own. Humility will become easy once we realize this life we've been given, it's not ours. Matthew 16, 25, Jesus says this, and he, he says, um, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In this world, so many of us, we live our whole lives trying to figure out what is my life about? How am I going to make an impact? How are people going to know who I am? And that's our goal, Right? that we want to leave the world a better place or we want to leave the world, you know, your world, a, a richer place or we want to leave something for someone. We want to make an impact. But what Jesus says is that whoever seeks to save their life will lose it. But if you will lose your life for my sake, that's when you truly find it. Paul later on in Philippians 2, he says in verse 17, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. What is Paul saying here? You see, it, it, the Jews would have all understood this context because they understood sacrifices. They used to have to give sacrifices until Jesus came and his life was the sacrifice that once and for all paid for us. But these sacrifices, they would bring either a firstborn lamb or maybe they would bring turtle doves or maybe they would bring um, some sort of liquid. They would bring it to the priest and the priest would put that on the altar. And this, this, this sacrifice that Paul is talking about is this liquid offering that they would pour onto an altar, basically a big barbecue, right? They'd pour that onto it and the, the, it would evaporate and that aroma would go towards heaven and that was the sacrifice to Jesus or to God. And what is Paul saying? He's comparing his life to that kind of sacrifice. He didn't choose to compare his life to a sacrifice of an animal, right? Because if you put an animal on an altar, there's something that's gonna be left. But if you pour liquid onto a barbecue, what happens? It's gone. And Paul is comparing his life to that. Even if God chooses to just pour my life out as an offering that's here and then it's gone. And he's still saying, I am glad and I will rejoice with you about it. Why? Because he realizes my life is not my own. And the more that I try to keep it, the more I try to save it, the more I try to work for my own good, the more I lose it. But the more that I say, you are more significant than me. 
and I will live my life to serve others and I will give God my life the more I realize how valuable my life is. Because when it's in the hands of God, it means something. When it's in my own hands, I only lose it. That's what Paul is saying here. It's a Bob Goff quote. It's really great. It says, God makes confetti out of all of our titles and accomplishments to celebrate the poor and the humble. He doesn't care about our titles and our accomplishments. The things that in this world, that's what we care about, right? Well, you gotta get up the, you know, the ladder. You gotta make your way up. It's a dog eat dog world out there. But Jesus comes in and he says, nah, just stand with the outcast. Stand with the poor. Show my love to those who haven't felt it yet. There's a woman, um, Amy Carmichael, and she was a missionary in the, the early 1900s. She, this story, I don't know if it's true, but it's, it's like a story, a legend about her. When she was a little girl, she had uh, brown eyes and she wished she was born with blue eyes. And so I, I have blue eyes, so sorry, I'm just kidding. But Amy, she would wish she was born with blue eyes because she felt like blue eyes were more pretty, brown eyes are not pretty. And so she would pray, God, why don't you change my eyes from brown to blue? I want blue eyes so I can be pretty. And God never answered that prayer. And as she grew up, she felt a real strong call to go help the poor. And she wanted to be a missionary. She was actually turned down from being a missionary multiple times. And finally, she found a church that would send her to be a missionary. And she went and she spent the rest of her life in India. And she opened up orphanages. And one of the things that she would do, they had temple prostitutes, which a lot of times were little kids who were forced into slavery. And she would go in and she would rescue those children. And she would basically kidnap them out of that horror-filled life. And she would come and let them live with her. And she started these orphanages. And the thing that's significant about her is that when she would dress up like an Indian, no one could tell that she wasn't Indian because she had brown eyes. God had created her on purpose and for a purpose. And she chose to live a life completely poured out. And when she died on her deathbed, she told the little kids that she'd given her life for. She said, I don't want a headstone. I don't want anything marking my grave. And so they took her after she died and they buried her in the garden. And they put a bird bath there. But on the bird bath, they had inscribed A-M-M-A, which is Hindu for mom. You can't tell me that she didn't think her her life meant something. When I look at life, I want my life to be more like no one knows my name, but at least I lived my life poured out for what God wanted rather than I'm gonna step on everyone's head to get what I need. God asks us to be humble. He asks us to be like Jesus who didn't count being an equal with God to be something he needed to attain to but humbled himself, lived as a man, lived a perfect life for you and for me. There's a verse that I love and it says that he, became, he who knew no sin, meaning he never sinned one day of his life, became sin for us. On that cross, he took on every sin, the punishment of all of the wrong that I've done, that you've done, that had to be accounted for. He took that on and he said, my life is enough. I'll take it on. It's so significant because even though he died, he came back to life to give every single one of us life. And maybe you're in this room today and you say, I don't know him. I don't know Jesus. I don't know how to follow him. Let me tell you something. He knows you. He made you. He formed you. Maybe in your life, you've been told you were an accident, that you were a mistake, that nobody wants you. Let me tell you something. You were not an accident. God made you. He formed you. And he made you on purpose for a purpose in this life. And he desperately wants to show you his love. And the Bible says in Romans that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is, was God and you confess with your mouth that he, raised from the, he, he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. If you trust that Jesus was God, you believe that he is Lord, 
then you could enter into an awesome relationship with God. And I want to invite you today, if you've never entered into a relationship with God, if you've never really followed Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity today. We're all going to bow our heads. We're all going to pray a prayer. But today, it's not a magic prayer. It's just a way of us saying, God, I put my faith in you. I'm giving you my life. I want to live for something greater. I want to live for something more. And so would you today, if that's you, would you pray this prayer with me? Everyone's going to pray it so you won't be singled out. But if you believe it, say it with faith in your heart. Believe that it is true. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your son. Jesus, thank you for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying for me. Even before I ever chose you. Thank you for choosing me. I believe you are God. I believe you rose from the dead. I give you my life. Teach me how to live it. In Jesus' name, amen.